Looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another recreational pogroming session with Azuzin. Let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream as usual. So red circle uh, live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch? A uh, dot a television a uh, website. Today we're doing uh, data mining and see how about that. So uh, I'm going to give the link to where we're doing all that. HTTPS twitch.tv slash sodding and I'm going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinged. And there we go. The stream has officially started. The stream has officially started. So the title is pretty loud, but we're not going to be doing anything like super, super special, right? Uh, especially if you are like a person who works in data mining industry, it's probably not going to be that interesting for you. But what I want you to do today, I want you to implement a, a key means clustering algorithm in C, right? So if you want to learn more about this kind of thing, you can find it in here. I'm going to copy paste it in the chat of the people who's watching that on YouTube. It's going to be in the description, of course. So and um, so I learned about this algorithm in the context of one meme paper that was circulating around in 2022 when the chat GPT was like the hot thing and stuff like that. And it's basically the sort of like the code name of that paper is GZIP is all you need, right? It's a, it's a pretty funny thing. It's sort of the idea in, um, you know, classification of the, of the documents, right? So essentially, uh, this paper demonstrated that you can quite easily classify documents by just gzipping them and doing k means clustering on them and that basically competes in the performance with like a you, you know like deep learning algorithms and stuff like that so very, very dumb thing performs better than just like uh, large language models and stuff like that for classifying documents and it's just like very unexpected and it was like well, what the fuck is k means clustering and k means clustering is a very interesting algorithm Essentially, you give it uh, a set of points, right, of some sort of observations, right? In, in here, I suppose it's a set of documents, right? So doc one document is going to be one point, right? And essentially, you say, okay, I want to have, I want to split this entire set of points into k clusters. You basically decide how many clusters you want to have. And what it tries to do, it tries to find uh, so-called centroids. I think they're called centroids or means, right? Uh, for each an individual cluster and it groups all of the points uh, to the cluster that are closer to that specific mean, right? So there is a pretty cool visualization of this algorithm, how it works, uh, right? So essentially here is an animation. You have a, a bunch of points and as you can see, you have centroids and the algorithm sort of like uh, uh, adjusts the centroids so uh, you can fit optimally uh, all of these uh, data sets in like three clusters. Right. So, and interestingly, it kind of reminds me of the machine learning algorithm, right? So you, you have some sort of like a cost function, some, some sort of parameter, and you adjust the parameters, aka centroids, so to, to optimize a certain cost function, and somehow you split the entire data set into, into K clusters. And uh, apparently the naive algorithm that is one of the uh, like most used algorithms, right? So the Wikipedia at least calls it a standard algorithm, is extremely simple. It is extremely simple. Uh, so to the point that, like, I mean, I can implement that in C. Uh, not only I can implement that in C, I want to actually write a visualization in Raybib with animation that just does that or something. Th that would have been interesting, I think. Uh, right, just visualize that stuff as well. Um, so it shouldn't be that difficult. Essentially, what you do, you have KMs, K centroids, K means, right? And essentially, you split uh, the entire set according to those means, right? So this is a very simple algorithm. As you can see, this is sort of like a for loop, right? This is a for loop. You're iterating from one to K for all J's between one and K. It's a for loop, right? It's more like a list comprehension, right? And then you take a point, uh, right? So you take a point and if one point is like uh, closer to the mean than the other point, you actually include that in a set, right? So basically you split all the points according to which set it is closer to, right? And then you update each and individual mean by uh, essentially summing up all of the values in that specific set and dividing it by the size of the set. And it's an iterative process and it slowly converges towards local optimum, 
right? It doesn't converge to the global optimum, but it converges to some local one depending on where you start. You can basically randomize uh, these means, right? You can randomize these means, and it, depending on how you randomize it, it will just find different optimums and also depends on the data set and stuff like that. And, and that's it. That's the entirety of the naive algorithm, right? And I suppose that's the most used algorithm as well, right? There's more optimal algorithms that go really nuts about different stuff, uh, but that's the basic idea. Uh, and once we nail that, once we implement that, we can try to tackle this paper. Like, I'm not going to try it today. That could be probably a separate stream, right? But we can try to just implement this kind of stuff today, uh, right? Just to learn to, how to use this algorithm, because I've never actually implemented that. Even though I went to a university, I, prayed, uh, I went to a pretty shady university that didn't teach me shit. So because of that, I have to sort of make up for that, uh, like myself on the streams, right? Like just reading Wikipedia and stuff like that. It sounds interesting. I really like that it's just that simple and it's really easy to comprehend and really easy to implement, really easy to visualize, uh, right? I really like things like that, like small little golden nuggets, right? That you can just like play around with. So yeah, uh, so let's go ahead and try to do that. How about that? All right, so let's go ahead and just create uh, some sort of a border plate, right? So uh, k uh, means, right? So this is going to be basically the folder where we do all of that. And I'm going to just create a simple hello world. And of course, for building this entire stuff, we're going to be using a knob, right? As usual, as usual, uh, because that's the only acceptable for me build system in C, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not true. I can use whatever build system like is required. But when I'm talking about like my personal projects in my personal projects, I do whatever the fuck I want. Right. And I want to use a uh, knob. I want to use knob. So I think knob is located somewhere here. So here it is knob.h. And there you go. So I need to create knob.c. Uh, and uh, in knob.c, we're going to be including the knob locally, right? And of course, we need to do uh, define knob implementation to make this knob.h act like a C file as well, because by default, it acts like a header. As soon as you include this thing, it starts to act like a C and uh, also includes implementations and stuff, implementations and stuff. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to do knob cmd. Uh, right, and we're going to just craft a simple command line uh, command line that is going to build our project. So for now, it's going to be very simplistic. Uh, nope, cmd append is going to be very, very simplistic. And it's going to simply just call cc. Uh, right, so then it's going to accept main.c. And then it's going to output the executable. Let's call it K means, right? So let's call it K means. And that's going to be about it. So I would also like to add maybe a bunch of warnings, maybe a bunch of extra warnings for extra safety, you know, if you know what I'm talking about. So we may also include uh, some debug information in case we want to debug something. And let's go ahead and uh, run this entire thing synchronously. I don't remember how to run it. So I think it's no CMD run synchronously right so we want to run it specifically synchronously right because we're not doing like a parallel uh build or anything like that and if it fails we're just gonna exit with non-zero exit code if it doesn't fail we exit with the zero code and also we should not forget maybe enable go rebuild yourself technology uh nob go rebuild yourself technology so we don't have to rebuild our build system over and over again especially every time we modify this entire thing and we're probably going to be modifying it uh pretty often i i do believe so right so let's go through the compilation error so you just pass it without any pointer and there we go we just compiled our own custom build system that we can try to run and that build system is supposed to uh build some other things so in here something weird happened uh, probably because I forgot to put a comma somewhere. Look at that. I forgot to put a comma, but that is a valid C code. That's the most annoying part about C is that uh, two uh, nearing string literals is considered to be a valid C code, a valid C expression, which is just like one string literal that looks like this, right? And if you forget to separate string literals with a comma, 
well, you can uh, you get very weird errors, honestly. But in any case, there we go. So we've got uh, our build going, right? So we got our build working. We got our build twerking. So and in the main thing, do we even do anything? I think we should just print something just in case. Like hello world. Uh, there we go. So I'm gonna rebuild this entire stuff, right? So it rebuilt it, and now I can do k-means, and it says hello world. How about that? How about that? So we also need to think about like uh, what kind of data set we are going to use. I suppose we can just generate some sort of a data set, right? So we can just generate some sort of a data set. Mm. So the it's kind of funny that on Wikipedia they're using so-called mouse data set. Uh, right, so artificial data set mouse. G guess why it is called mouse? <laughs> that is actually kind of funny, right? So this is actually kind of funny. So I suppose we can kind of do a similar thing right we can do a similar thing so essentially we can create a generator where you can put uh sort of like centroids and um it will generate random points around that specific centroid or something like that uh all right so we can do a similar thing it shouldn't be that difficult to do it shouldn't be that difficult to do uh okay so interestingly interestingly we need to now start using Raylib. So the problem with starting using Raylib is that I don't really have a Raylib build. In Usualizer, I actually build Raylib from source code from scratch every single time. Uh, so, and in here, I don't really want to do that. So maybe for now, as I develop this entire thing, as I'm prototyping this entire thing, I'm going to literally just copy paste libraylib.a from the Usualizer build and use it like raw, just like binary. I'm not going to commit that yet, but just for local quick iteration, just to get yourself started really quickly, I might actually do that. I might actually do that. I might copy, pa copy paste this thing in here. And then I can go and take the source code of this entire thing, right? So this is going to be raydeep. Uh, dot h right so here is a really dot h and as far as i know raylib also depends on ray math so this is another thing that we may need um and uh our lgl is another stuff that is very important in here right so that's that's all of the things we might as well even create a folder raylib where we're going to put all of the raylib stuff related things right so we're going to just like move that stuff in here uh, and the next thing we can try to do, we can try to include, simply include Raylib and marvel how it is not going to compile, right? So uh, look at that. So I'm going to do nob and it doesn't compile. It can't find Raylib. It can't find Raylib. So one of the things we probably need to do, we need to um, add the search path to, um, to the compilation target. So I'd like to split first. Uh, this entire stuff, uh, so the command line is a little bit shorter, right? so I'm going to do something like this. Uh, right, so here are sort of all of the flags. I might as well even split it like so. So here we sort of have a compiler, then all of these sort of flags, then the output, and maybe the input also is going to be like a separate line. So it's easier to sort of manage. So we're splitting all of that into logical chunks, into logical clusters, if you know what I mean. Oh, ha, ha. So we're going to do an opcmd append and then cmd. And we're going to do include path and we're going to just do ray lib like this. So there we go. So let's try to compile this entire thing. And as you can see, it successfully compiled, right? So, and it's successfully compiled because we don't really use anything from Raylib, right? So we can init window, right? We can just init the window, uh, provide the size, and then we can organize a loop. Organize a loop saying should uh, window while not window uh, should close. While not window should close, we're going to actually begin drawing. Uh, we're going to begin drawing and then we're going to end drawing like so. Then we're going to clear, uh, I think it's clear background. Let me open Raylib in here. So it's a clear, uh, yeah, it was a clear background, right? Clear background 
uh, red. And after we're done with this entire loop, we're going to close the window, right? We're going to close the window like so. So now if I try to compile that shit, it is not going to compile, right? It is not going to compile because I forgot to provide, um, you know, the title for the window. Let me see. So I, where do you put the title? I think you put title the last. So I'm going to put K means in here. There we go. So, and it compiled successfully, right? It compiled successfully, but didn't link properly. It didn't link properly because it doesn't uh, know where to find the library. So we can try to do the following thing. We can say, okay, link with uh, L, L Ray Lib, right? So, but it's still not going to find that because there's no such thing. So we also need to modify the search path for the libraries as well. We're going to put it in the same place where you have uh, you know, the headers and stuff like that. And now it kind of compiles, but it complains about missing other libraries. So we also need to link this entire stuff with the math library. And there you go. So we finally compiled. And if we now try to run uh, the entire program, right, if we try to run the entire program, we've got a window. It's that freaking simple. Uh, what's interesting is that, so the Raylib, the entirety of Raylib is basically this, right? So this is basically it's three headers one static library and I actually build that static library myself from scratch right so i didn't download it from the raylib official source i could have but i didn't right i just build it from scratch i just took it from visualizer and it still works it still works how about that that you expect that shit to happen minor for me okay gun so uh let's go ahead and maybe try to render something uh on the um, on the window right so first thing we need to do we need to uh, have a way to render the the samples that we're generating right because, because we're going to be clustering these samples right but before we can cluster them we need to generate them and as before we can generate them we need to a, a way to display them right so we need to figure out how exactly we're going to be displaying the, the dots, how exactly we're going to be displaying the samples, right? So uh, for the background, I think I'm going to be using my usual background, the same one as I have in, um, you know, in Emacs, right? So the hex code of this background is 18, 18, 18. It's a pretty good background, in my opinion. I don't remember how to specify the hex code for the, for the colors. Um, I think it's color get. Or maybe it is a get color, uh, right? Get color. So essentially, you can provide a hex value in here, uh, and that way we can do the following thing: get color, uh, something like this. I mean, hex is actually not this, right? So it's it's more like that. Uh, and let's go ahead and run it. This looks sus. Not gonna lie. This looks sus. This doesn't look like. Well, maybe maybe you want to do something like this. Uh-huh. So that means we have to do it like that. There we go. All right. So I forgot to provide the alpha, alpha channel. So it kind of, yeah, it kind of created this weird greenish color. It looks like the color that Jonathan Blow would use, honestly. Right. So, yeah, it, it looks like one of the, yeah, the John Blow theme. It, it is literally John Blow theme. He, he likes to put these kind of colors in his tests and stuff like that. It's just like, wow. <laughs> that's funny <laughs> it is the john blow color <laughs> it's kind of funny how it's instantly recognizable if you know what i mean right it is instantly recognizable somehow um okay so how are we going to be generating the points right so we can just go ahead and draw some points on the screen uh luckily we have functions like a draw uh, circle right and it's pretty pretty straightforward right so just draw the circle uh, we're gonna render it maybe somewhere let's say it at the center so we can get screen width and as far as no screen width it's not the size of the whole screen it is the size of the window for some reason uh, yeah get current screen width um, and there's also render yeah so I, I don't quite understand like what's the difference between these things so one is one, one considers ihdpi but i remember when i started to use this thing there were some problems on mac os ah i i suppose so essentially in in hdpi you have more pixels sort of like per pixel right so 
Because of that, the value in render width and height is going to be bigger, actually. Right, so, and bec maybe because of that, the, the scaling was kind of weird on macOS, right? So, but we had a bug. I was using render width in visualizer and uh, macOS people basically changed it to screen and they said that it fixed the problem with scaling for them, for them. Right, so I suppose that's what we want to use generally, right? So I don't really know what's up with that, but if that makes macOS people happy, so like, I mean, so be it, so be it. So we're going to put like a... Uh, all of that stuff in the center, uh, right? So we're gonna put all of that stuff in the center. Height and uh, what kind of radius is we're gonna we're gonna have? Let's say we're gonna have like a thirty, and the color is gonna be red for now. So because I want to be able to see that little dot in there, it's not really that little, honestly. Uh, it's not really that little. So what about like ten pixels? Yeah, ten pixels looks okay. Um, yeah, so that looks okay. Uh, that looks okay. And essentially, we probably want to be able to render the points on different ranges, if you know what I mean, right? We want to be able to render them on different ranges. But does it really even matter? Does it even really matter? It probably doesn't matter if you think about it. Right, so what I was thinking, what I was thinking is that maybe I want to sort of make it so... Uh, left is going to be like minus 20 and the right is going to be plus 20, right? So up is going to be like plus 20 and minus 20 or something like that. And all of that, all of those ranges are going to be configurable. So you can sort of fit different kinds of data and stuff like that. But since we're kind of just want to generate a bunch of random things and just cluster them, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe we can do all of that within the ranges from 0 to 80 and 0 to not 80 800 and 0 to 600 so maybe that's fine right because we're not going to be working with the real data though we're going to be working with the real data in the future right so we're going to be working with the real data in the future so we'll need to think how uh we want to approach that so maybe i'm going to actually create the range right so maybe i'm still going to create the range so we're going to have something like minimal x right so the minimal x is going to be minus 20 right so and the maximum x maximum as x is going to be plus 20 so and the same is going to go for for y right the same is going to go for y and essentially maybe we're going to have something like project uh project sample right so project sample so you you're gonna give the uh the coordinates of the sample in this range in this specific range right so vector 2 sample uh, and as far as i know i think it's somewhere in ray math so there's a structure vector 2 electric boogaloo there we go so here is the vector 2 okay uh and we're going to accept that and we're going to get get a vector in the screen coordinate. So maybe we're going to do a project sample to screen, right? Is that a good name? Is that, is that a good name? Maybe it's too long. I don't really know. I don't really know. So, but essentially what we want to do, right? So we have a sample somewhere on the range of min minus 20 to 20. We kind of want to convert this entire thing to a range from 0 to 1 because it will allow us to map the entire thing to the screen. Right, so and essentially how we can do that, right, we can find the sort of the length of this entire range, we can find the length of this entire range, which is going to be max x minus min x, and that's basically sort of like the entire length uh, of this range, right, and uh, then we probably, um, so we probably need to shift the x of the sample to start from zero to start from zero to that specific length right to that specific length and to do that i suppose we need to subtract the minimal x right so by subtracting to the minimal x we kind of like mapping the sample from this range from this range to uh zero 40 range if you know what i mean right so we're sort of so the the range is negative positive but we're shifting it to be from zero to the length of this entire thing which makes it then super easy which makes it super easy to map to zero one by just dividing by l right 
So that's basically what it is. We might as well even inline this entire length. And that's basically the uh, first sort of like normalized X. This is a normalized X. It's from 0 to 1. And you want to do with the Y uh, as well, right? So we're basically remapping this entire thing like that. Uh, right, we're basically remapping it. And uh, all of that, so we have x and y in 0 to 1. But now what we have to do, right, to map it properly to, to the screen is we need to know the size of the screen. We already know it. So it's a screen uh, width and we just multiply it by x, right? So, and essentially what we can return here, we can probably return collateral uh, vector 2 and this is going to be just that. This is going to be just that. So we'll have to replace maybe width with height and something like this. So interestingly, maybe we can even inline all of that shit to make it even more unreadable for the normies. So yeah, that's that's a good idea. Look at that. Look at that. So we really want to make it unreadable for the normies so we can gatekeep all of our mathematical secrets. That's what we want to do. Uh, honestly, right, so we probably need to do that in a very specific order, right? So we want to do that in a very specific order because we're going to be going from left to right. So that's the first operation is going to be and then this one. So we kind of want to do that in that specific order, which of course makes it even more unreadable for the normies, right? So and that's very important. That's uh, very important. So there we go. So we, we got the projection formula. We got the projection formula. It's a very simple formula. All right. Very simple formula. Mm -hmm. um, yes, 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 yes. And essentially, uh, we can try to maybe map that thing. So we're going to have some sort of like a test sample, right? So here is a sample. And this is going to be sample at, um, you know, Minus 10, minus 10. I think that's a that's a pretty good sample. That's a pretty good sample. So it's supposed to be maybe somewhere uh, at the left bottom corner of the screen. At the left bottom corner of the screen, I think. Right, that's going to be the, the, the situation in here. So and now we are projecting uh, the sample to the screen and we need to render it but I can't render it with this function because this function accepts the coordinates separately so we need to find a different function so I think there was a draw uh, circle v which accepts the vector instead right so which accepts the vector instead so we know that the radius is 10 the color is red and we can just do something like that instead of the center look at that look at how it looks like draw a circle project sample to the screen and we just render it so we expect it to be on the left bottom uh quarter of the screen and it's probably not going to be true it's probably going to be on the left upper one because the y coordinates is flipped uh, as in any self-respecting graphical library right so let's actually see if it is true or not uh there we go it is in the upper one instead of the bottom one which begs the question uh which begs the question should we flip it to be more mathematical should we flip it to be more mathematical i'm not really sure we could probably flip it we could probably flip it by uh, just taking this entire thing and subtracting it like that. Uh, so I don't really like how we call function every time we need to get the width and height. So maybe one of the things we're going to do is uh, basically cache all of those things, right? So we're going to simply cache them. Uh, so this is going to be uh, width and height. And then we're going to put it like this. Come on. Boom. So hopefully that will flip it. Um, not necessarily. We can flip it by actually, well, I mean, by actually moving H outside, right? So essentially something like this. But it's basically the same, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's basically, it's basically the same. Right? Yeah. So this one of the things we can do. But anyway. Uh, anyway, 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 anyway. So there we go. So it is at the bottom. So in more of a mathematical manner. In a more of a mathematical manner. So the, the entire thing is not particularly resizable. So what if we make it resizable? This is actually very interesting. So how do you make the window resizable in it? Um, so set window flags, I think. Mm -mm, resizable. Okay. So there are some flags, system window flags, config flags. 
and nothing except yeah you can set the config flags i suppose right so we can try to set the config flags right before we initialize the window and one of the things we can say we can do resizable uh, window resizable uh, and we're gonna just slap it in here straight up slap it in here uh, there we go so it is resizable and as we go as you can see it scales it scales accordingly it is actually scales accordingly isn't that borders mind friend okay so here's a funny thing so if we did everything correctly if we did everything correctly the zero zero should be at the center of the screen there we go it is at the center of the screen and no matter how we recite it it's going to stay at the center of the screen right so it is in fact at the center of the screen isn't that cool, isn't that cool? i think it's pretty freaking cool very simple formula maximum result uh lol it is easier than centering div in css you know it you know it but all of the react devs are going to be in denial saying that you don't understand the actual business need of the enterprise you don't understand that it needs to be overcomplicated like that you don't understand you don't understand i'm in denial you don't understand <clears throat> anyway <laughs> Zozin, programming has to be shed. Software must be shed. Dog shed slow. It you don't. It must be. There's no way around it. It just must be like that. You, you don't understand. It's like it, it must be. <laughs> um. Must be. Must be. Um. Okay, so I, I suppose we're ready to generate some some random points. How about that? We're ready to generate some random points. So what I'm thinking is that we need to actually have a dynamic array of points, right? So a dynamic array of points. So let's actually introduce something like uh, samples, right? Something like samples. And we're going to have uh, items, right? So this is going to be count and this is going to be capacity. And this is a dynamic array, essentially. This is a dynamic array. So it's, it feels like something from from Rayleap. Is it going to collide with Rayleap, right? No, it's not going to collide, I don't think so. But anyway, so, and we probably wanna have a function to generate a bunch of points around certain center, right? So basically generate a cluster, right? Generate cluster. So we're going to provide this center, right? So this is where around this specific center, we want to generate a bunch of points. Uh, we're going to specify also the radius, right? Right. So radius within which radius we want to generate all of that stuff. Uh, and also probably how many points we want to generate. And uh, so there we go. So this is basically going to be the samples. So, and that algorithm should just generate a bunch of points. It should just generate a bunch of points. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to iterate through all of the, like, count, right? So how many things we have to generate. So this is going to count plus plus i. Uh, and um, I suppose uh, what we're going to do, um, we need to basically generate a vector, right? We basically need to generate a vector because we are generating like around certain centroid, right? So we're generating around certain centroid. Uh, so essentially we have just a circle. We have just a circle and we are gonna Monte Carlo that motherfucker like this, right? Uh, <laughs> I just realized that's gonna be a pretty funny clip out of the context. <clears throat> so, yeah. And essentially what we need to do, we need to generate a random vector, right? with a random direction and a random magnitude, a random magnitude from zero, zero to one. So random direction and a random magnitude. And as soon as we have that, right, we can pretty much scale it and offset it to any center and any radius. If that makes any sense, right? If that makes any sense. <laughs> Monte Carlo equals random, yes. <clears throat> so, if you are 
talking to normies, right? And you need to gatekeep all of the uh, precious knowledge when you're talking to normies. Instead of random, you have to use uh, words like Monte Carlo or another good gatekeeping word is stochastic, right? So Monte Carlo or stochastic. To be fair, stochastic these days became a meme due to, uh, you know, rising popularity of uh, large language models. So a lot of normies kind of learned the, the word stochastic, right? Because there was a stochastic parrot meme. So it kind of like lost its uh, gatekeeping qualities. So I personally would recommend to use Monte Carlo instead, right? So yeah, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> so yes, yes, yes. So how are we gonna be generating all that? So we need to generate a random direction. We need to generate a random direction. So that means we need to generate a direction from zero to two pi. 2 to two, 2 2 pi 2 2 2 pi so how can, can we generate a, like a random thing from 0 to pi we we can generate a thing from 0 to 1 right so random uh, from 0 to 1 and multiply it by 2 pi and that will give us like the, the random direction from 0 to 2 pi but how can we generate stuff from 0 to 1 in in c we don't really have that right so we only have thing that generates integers so the thing i like to do i like to have something like rand float right which basically generates like a value from 0 to 1 i don't remember if a knob if i included that thing in knob oh by the way by the way, do you guys remember the change log of Ray Deep? Do you guys remember the change log of Ray Deep? In the change log of Ray Deep of the version 5.0, they said that they finally introduced random number generators. Maybe the time has come to test it out. Okay, let's give it a try. Random. Uh, get ra It's integers. What the flipping integers? Is that it? Really? Useless! Anyway, so we're gonna do our own one. <laughs> I'm just joking, by the way. <laughs> we could have used this one, right? So, um, but it's just like, then depending on the distance between min and max, we would decide the resolution of the random number, right? So, but I would like to have the maximum resolution. So, yeah, essentially what I like to do. So, if I take a look at the function rand, Rand range. So it has a very interesting property. It generates the um, the values from zero to rand max. From zero to rand max, inclusive, by the way, which is which is fine actually, which is exactly what we want. So and essentially, what you can do, you can just take rand and divide it by rand max. And of course, before you do that, you you want to convert it to float, and that effectively gives you the value from zero to one with the maximum resolution, with <laughs> Well, I mean, technically, it's going to be a value from 0 to 1. <clears throat> I think it's... <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah. Um, rand float. And we're going to multiply it by 2 pi. And do we have pi in ready? Does anybody know? Do we have pi? Yeah, we do have pi. Would you look at that? What the fuck? Uh, all right, so and this is a random angle, by the way. So and we want to have a random magnitude, uh, rand float. There we go. We just generated a random point within circle, uh, at with the center at zero zero and with the radius one. So, but it allows us to scale this entire thing and offset this entire thing however we want, however we want. So, and how we're going to be scaling and offsetting this entire step. So, essentially, let's create a vector2 sample, right? So, this is going to be something like x. And we're going to say that this is the center plus uh, cosine, uh, plus cosine of that specific angle multiplied by, um, yeah, multiplied by the magnitude, right? So, multiplied by the magnitude, but also multiplied by the radius. Right. So because cosine is going to give you sort of the length, um, the length one, right? So you want to shorten it up to, to the magnitude that we generated from zero to one, and then you want to scale it again to the actual radius. And you want to do the same thing with y, if I'm not mistaken. But here we have to use synth. 
and that's about it actually that's about it so then you can do knob da da append uh samples 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 so we are appending all of the samples in here and theoretically we just generated the cluster we just generated the cluster it's pretty cool i guess so uh let's just generate a simple cluster right so gonna be samples cluster so this is gonna be that and then let's go ahead and grab the generator the gener degenerator <laughs> degenerate cluster right so the center where are we going to be the center where are we going to have the center so i suppose we're going to have center at zero zero so that makes sense uh so how can i quickly do that is there any quick way to do that uh, without the collateral and some other shit i suppose there is no such way to do that uh, maybe we can do it like that. So what's going to be the radius? Let's actually say it's going to be 10, right? So how many points we want to have? We want to have maybe also 10, right? So, and we're going to have also 10. And then I'm going to provide a pointer to the cluster. Clutter, cluster. <laughs> right. And we need to start iterating uh, through all of the points within that cluster, right? So we need to start iterating from them. Okay, so I'm going to just iterate class, cluster, uh, I think it's count, right? So it is in fact count, right? And in here, so you have a sample, and uh, this is going to be basically cluster uh, items items i, all right? And we're just mapping this entire thing to the screen, and we're just using it. So one of the things I like to do when I'm iterating uh, this thing, I would like to have it, which is going to be basically something like this. Right, so it's a little bit more readable. There we go. Uh, hopefully, we managed to generate some some clusters. Okay, it doesn't compile because we don't even include uh, the standard library where the rand is located. We don't include the maths library. We need to include the maths library. And do we have a nob da append? It is from nob. That means we also have to include. Uh, nob, nob.h, and of course we have to define nob implementation, and there we go, we are ready to do that. So we just generated some cluster, so this is only 10 points. So we Monte Carlo that mother flipper. Simply uh, Monte Carlo that mother flipper. So uh, we can actually provide maybe bigger amount of points, right? So we can say uh, maybe 100. What if we generate 100 of these points 10 times? Uh, there we go. So this is basically 100. So that's pretty porous. So we've got a data set. We've got a data set at the center as well. You know what's funny is that we can do that several times at the different centers several times at different centers and put everything into a single sort of like set well, maybe we should actually call this thing a set right so i think that makes a little bit more sense so this is going to be le set le set <sighs> okay so what's going to be the second place so let's actually also generate the mouse um the mouse data set right how about that so the mouse data set so the second data set, of course, is going to be smaller, right? So maybe half of half as small. And uh, then maybe we're going to actually go to half of the mean x, right? So we're going to take half of the mean x. Maybe I'm going to even multiply it by half like this. And in terms of y, um, yeah, maybe it's also going to be half of the max y, right? Halfway. Uh, and essentially the right ear right the right ear is going to be max x right so we want to generate something like this uh so that <laughs> so disney lawsuit incoming <laughs> so yeah Mm -mm. so this is the thing that we probably th this is kind of weird like wh why is it like that why is it like denser in here 
Uh, so maybe actually, in terms of like the amount of points, I actually want to have less point in here because the ears are a little bit too dense. If you know what I mean, they're a little. Bit... And the the funniest thing is that they kind of like dense in the center. Is that like expected in here, or did they fuck up something about the the random number generator? Or what's interesting is that I don't really change the seed, right? So maybe I need to change the seed according to the current time. Right, so that's one of the things we can do, just change the seed. So, yeah, that's really weird. And it's kind of different. Uh, we can probably bind some sort of a lebatone uh, where we're going to regenerate those things over and over again, right? So, if is key pressed key R. So what we want to do, we want to reset the entire thing and basically regenerate all of that stuff, right? So if I try to run this one more time, uh, they kind of, at least by the feel, maybe not, maybe I'm just imagining it, but it feels like they're more denser to the center. So there's definitely something uh so maybe make the dots smaller maybe that's a good idea actually so uh, let's say maybe sample radius right so this is a sample radius so let's actually put this kind of stuff like sample radius so this is going to be 2.5 f and let's also introduce maybe sample color though we're going to have samples of different color we're going to have samples of different color as we cluster them differently so uh, yeah, they do feel denser at the center a lot of time. Okay, can't you even see that? I'm pretty sure maybe it's too small actually. So let's do something like four. Rand is not uniform. Yeah, that's true. It is true that it is not uniform, not particularly uniform. Maybe that's fine. Maybe that's even better because you can like more clearly see where are the centroids of the clusters and stuff like that it looks actually kind of cool <laughs> i really like that uh i really really like that all right so uh let me let me think let me think okay so i already ran out of tea and i already streaming for one hour so i suppose this is a good moment this is a good moment to make a small break right a refill a cup of tea and after the small break we're gonna start clustering this mother flippers how about that? Sounds good. Sounds Gucci. Sounds what? Tamaguchi. Let's go. All right. So let's go ahead and see what we can do in here. So this is a K means clustering. So that means we need to decide up front how many Ks we're going to have, right? So maybe we're going to just literally define this entire thing. So I'm going to define K, right? And as of right now, it is three. You can clearly see uh, that uh, this thing is uh, three of them, right? There we go. So there's a three clusters in here, right? So there's a three clusters. Uh, and now what we want to do, what we want to do, we want to probably pre-allocate sort of like an array of clusters, right? An array of clusters into which we're going to be clustering things, right? So uh, I'm going to do the following thing. So this is the samples. And this is an like actually an array clusters, right? So this is the clusters and there is a K of them, right? So it's actually also zero initialize, also make it static and stuff like that. Might as well also make these things static. So making them static means that they're not going to be visible outside of the translation unit, which helps the, the compiler to do more optimizations. For example, maybe it will be able to in line some of the functions small functions like rand float we can maybe do static in line to help it a little bit more who knows right so so saying that we're not going to use that outside of this current translation unit kind of helps the optimizer and stuff like that so anyway uh, also we're going to have the uh, the means themselves right so the means themselves and this is going to be an array of actually not floats but rather vectors right so uh, you know, array of vectors. 
So, and the first thing we need to do, we probably need to, right, so we generated the set, that's totally fine. We need to generate random means, right? So how are we gonna do that? I suppose we can just iterate through k means, right? Like so, uh, k plus plus i, and just pick a random point on the screen, a random point on the screen. Uh, so this is going to be means i, x is going to be rand float, rand float, multiplied, multiplied by max x minus min x, right, so the whole range, um, plus min x, right, so we're generating like, like within a particular range. So could have been, this is basically lerp, isn't it? This is basically lerp. Maybe we should like literally implement something like lerp. Uh, lerps, do we still have, do we already have lerp in the standard library? Apparently we don't have, right, so could have done something like min x, uh, max x, right, and then say something like this. Uh, for some reason, I never feel the need to have lerp function, right? I usually implement lerp directly, right, as I just did. For some reason, for my brain, it's just like easier to think in this specific like thing. So Rayleigh has lerp, people say. Let's see. Lies. Oh, it's it's a Ray math. Okay. <laughs> I was almost about to ban you. Okay, so. Mm, 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 mm. So I guess that's fine. I guess that's fine. Uh, so let's go ahead and start using it. So there's going to be a lerp. Min x max uh, max x rand float. So we're going to have something like this. And this is going to be y. And we're doing that from... Uh, min y and max y and there we go we have a random mean we have a random means of production so and we're gonna do a similar thing uh, as we do with the uh, with the set right so we're gonna have like a k uh, and in here we have min i and here i suppose we want to have a different radius right so we're gonna have something like a mean radius but i want it to be bigger right so you can clearly see that specific mean right away so let's make maybe make, make it yellow or something right so the samples right now are going to be red but the mean uh, around which we cluster and everything is going to be yellow so uh let me see so lerp is not available because we have to include ray maps ray maps okay and mean so there's several of them uh, and mean radius is not defined. Let's go ahead and define it. And I might as well even define this entire thing in terms of the sample radius, right? Every time I modify the sample radius, the mean radius is also going to be bigger and it's also going to be twice as much of as uh, the sample radius so we can always see it. So there we go. Uh, so generated like three of them in really weird places, but maybe that's fine. Maybe that's fine. So another interesting thing, uh, I think when we press R, we should regenerate not only the uh, set, we also regenerate the means, right? So this is sort of going to be the button that resets literally everything. I think that's very good, right? And as you can see, we're just generating those things in different places, right? So these are initial means, initial places of means. Uh, all right, so that's pretty cool. I also would like to have maybe different colors for those means, right? Because we're going to be visualizing the points depending on what cluster they belong to. If you know what I mean, what cluster they belong to, uh, right? So essentially, um, if it belongs to a particular cluster, it's going to be colored in a particular color. Um, so maybe we could introduce something like color colors, and you have K colors in here, right? So you have K colors, um, and we probably want to generate maybe random colors, right? So we probably want to generate random colors and stuff. Uh, and how are we going to be doing all of that? So we have gray, gray. I want to just take the ray leap colors, right? So I want to just take the ray leap colors and pick random colors from that specific set. Okay. So let me, let me see how can we easily do all of that. Um, I specifically avoided 
dark gray gray light gray because i don't think having grays in there is that like good of an idea we might as well also avoid dark colors right so we want to have like bright colors in here so this is going to be that so let's just remove them uh right so we want to have bright colors so the next thing i would like to do is probably get rid of all of these things right so we don't need that and we probably also want to get rid of these things right we're getting rid of those things and delete trailing white spaces there we go we got this stuff we can query replace actually want to query replace with uh regular expressions so at the end of the line uh we want to put a comma all right so this is the comma i don't know what the fuck happened here i think i did a fucky wacky as usual and there we go so we have like a ray leap colors sort of speak so this is going to be static uh color uh ray lib colors so this is basically how many of them we have so and when we are generating this kind of stuff we can just pick a thing from there or in fact we can just use these colors directly we can just use these colors directly but then uh, what if you define more clusters than you have colors in here there's two options in here we can forbid that we can add a static assert which says that uh, array length right array length of uh, this thing and k should be less than equal to that right if it is bigger than that right so we don't have enough colors so this is one of the uh things we can do in here or we can simply wrap around right so if you have too many clusters they're gonna wrap around this color so we're gonna reuse some of the colors so what i'm thinking is that i think i'm gonna go with the latter uh right so i'm gonna simply wrap around so i'm gonna simply wrap around so we have this amount of colors so we're gonna be just using them so and how we're gonna be approaching all of that so as you can see here we use yellow right so we're gonna be using actually colors and we're gonna do i uh, and we have to wrap it around so we have to wrap it around with knob array length of the colors but that is too much right so i think i would like to wrap it into the colors colors count or something but i'm not sure if it is shorter if you know what i mean right i'm really not sure like so if you compare that colors count it is shorter it saves us nine characters which is well obviously something that we would like to take right so and here we're just wrapping around we're just wrapping around uh and let's actually see how it's gonna go uh so something really weird is going on right so because i provided the colors did i not recompile or something uh so this is yellow uh i recompiled oh wait they are different this one is orange this one is yellow they, they look very similar actually they look very similar because yellow golden okay um. <laughs> these are different colors <laughs> these are three dots with different colors <laughs> I mean, technically, yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> but, it, I mean, that actually made me think that I made an error somewhere, that uh, I have a bug somewhere. It's just like the colors look almost the same. <sighs> anyway, so, I mean, we, we can just remove some of them. Well, let's actually keep golden, right? So, who needs yellow when you have gold, right? now we're talking you have red and pink red and pink so that's actually pretty cool so do we have any other like lime for instance so yeah let's actually do green sky blue uh-huh purple yeah i want to keep the names with like the colors with the fancy names if you know what i mean right yeah so essentially uh yellow gold orange we're gonna keep only gold red eh, pink what is maroon by the way uh, like i don't really speak english so i don't really know what maroon means 
Uh, oh, th that's basically the brownish crimson, brownish crimson color. Aha, uh -huh. so that means maybe we want to actually keep uh, maroon instead of red. All right, so it means that one, that one, that one, uh, beige, brown. Yeah, I guess that's fine. So they're different colors. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're different colors. They're different enough. Yeah, I would say they're different enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. Or maybe they're not really that vibrant, right? So they're kind of dark. Yeah, I'm going to keep these things. Yeah, so I'm going to keep these things. There's not that many colors, but that's fine. Uh, yeah. Something like this. Okay, cool. Uh, now, what we're going to have... We need to start clustering these things, right? We need to start clustering these things. And how are we going to be clustering this thing? Okay, so we have to uh, essentially iterate through each individual point, right? And see to whom that point is closer, whom that closer who the, whom that point is closer to right is that how we say that in english but anyway uh so let's go ahead and iterate the set All right so this is going to be set zero less um count plus plus i and according to the wikipedia according to the wikipedia we have to essentially do the square mean right um so how do I interpret that? I suppose it's going to be more of a, like a two-dimensional, um, two-dimensional thing, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we'll need to have a two like nested loop in here. So we're iterating each individual set, and for that specific set, we're going to be iterating each individual cluster, right? We're iterating each individual cluster, so basically the K. So I can see why it is like a very slow algorithm, right? To, because to recluster things, to recluster things, you have to do stuff like that. I wonder if you can optimize it if you don't recluster from scratch every time. Because one of the things we'll have to do, right? So one of the things we'll have to do before uh, like reclustering everything, we'll have to iterate through each individual cluster, right? And basically clean it up, right? We're first going to be cleaning up the like all of the clusters, and only then just going and figuring out things for 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 the clusters. Uh, then what we do, we take the point, right? So I can take vector two point set items i. So here is the point, and here we have the mean uh, means j, right? And now we need to find who's the closest to, um, right? To which cluster? To which cluster this thing is the closest? If I understand correctly. Uh, right. So let me see. Do we have something like a vector sub uh, subtract? Right. We do in fact have vector subtract. Uh, right. And we're subtracting the point from like m from the point. So we get that. So and then we have a length, but yeah, we, we have a length squared. Right. We have a length squared, which is basically what it is. Right. So which is basically what it is. So we can just do that. Uh, like so, and there we go, we've got the value, and we are minimizing by that specific value, right? We're minimizing by that specific value. So now, um, I need to basically keep track of the index that is the closest, right? So uh, maybe I'm going to have something like size t k, but at the beginning, at the very beginning, uh, we're not going to have any cluster sort of assigned to uh, to P in here, right? So that's kind of the problem. That's kind of the problem. But maybe that's not the problem. Um, right, so essentially, we still need to um, mark it as minus one, right? So it doesn't belong to anything. And then we need to keep track of this specific value. Let's call it something like S. Right, and since we're minimizing it, we want it to make super big, right? So is there something FLT max or something like that? So then when I have something like SM uh, and I do something like if 
sm is smaller than s, it will actually trigger this entire thing. Uh, right, so then I can do s sm and then k equal j. And that way I sort of like figure out the cluster into which I want to push that specific button, right? If push that specific point, right? So this is the case cluster and we're going to be doing knob di append, knob di append, of course, we're going to take it by pointer. And then I'm just pushing that specific point in there, right? So something like that, something like that. Uh, so, but I'm not sure if FLT max is uh, like an actual thing. It's probably isn't right. So, but maybe I just need to include some stuff. Like I, I can never remember the name. I can never remember the header that I have to. Yeah. So FLT max and mean are a thing. Um, are a thing and what do I include? So limits. Do I just include limits to include that? I think limits only contained integers, right? I think there was something like floats or what not. Numeric limits. Mm -hmm. FLT max, right? And what was the float? Yeah. Floating point limits are located within float.h. Limits.h contains integer limits. Maybe I, I don't really, it's kind of bizarre to me. Not gonna lie, but I mean, it's, it's C. What did you expect? Uh, it's, it's just float. It's not even, you know, there we go. Uh, okay. So it didn't crash at least or anything. Uh, so I suppose now when we're rendering the point, we should, instead of rendering the set of points, we should render individual clusters, if you know what I mean. Uh, right. So how are we going to be doing all of that? So within uh, this entire thing, I'm going to be iterating the specific cluster, right? So it's going to be J um, less than cluster I count. Right? So we're iterating each cluster and then each point within the cluster. All right, and in here, and in here is going to be it cluster i items j, right? We are projecting it. Uh, we take sample radius, we, we take sample radius, and we use the colors um, of the case cluster. So we use i actually. So, and since we're going to be using that for both the, um, the sample and the mean, I feel like it makes sense to actually factor out that to a separate variable caller, like so. So it can be used within this loop and this thing as well. I think it does in fact make sense. I think it does in fact make sense. So let's actually remove this it because it's not that big anyway. Here we do need it because this expression is pretty long, so I'd like to even have it. Uh, so yeah, effectively by doing it like that, we're going to color samples according to their current cluster, the, the, the cluster they belong to, hopefully, if we actually did everything correctly. So this is actually several clusters, and hope, um, uh, here we also have two. And we got a segmentation fault. It's so fucking cool. I like that. It's kind of funny. Um, right. It is, in fact, kind of funny. Uh, I wonder why, though. I wonder why, though. So because we do that stuff in here. So cluster I, K, uh, J, Aha! <laughs> Freaking. <laughs> Classic. Classic. That's why you should program the roles. Okay. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? I think it's it's fair to to actually use this kind of algorithm. Yeah. I think, I think it is. So now they are colored uh, differently. Huh. Wait. That's a bit bizarre. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see. Because when I refresh, it doesn't recluster them. Okay. Yeah, yeah it doesn't recluster them. Um, so I think we need to have separate operations right we need to have a separate operation so here uh we're generating like a new set like generating completely new um set and here we're doing clustering 
right? We're doing clustering. So I feel like we need to factor out these operations into their own sort of like um, functions, right? So set, I feel like maybe the set must be also a static variable in here, right? So clusters only kind of like reuse the stuff from the set. They only kind of reuse the stuff from the set. Uh, but in here, when we are regenerating, uh, we set count to zero. And that is already equal to literally um, what we do down there, I think. Yeah, it's not even equal to what we do down there. Almost. Yeah, because there is a like a padding, additional padding here. That's why I couldn't find it. But I mean, it's the same iteration. So we have a chunk of code that is repeated two two times, right? So how are we gonna call this entire thing? So generate new set, right? New set, uh, or maybe new state. I think I think that's a good name for that. Generate new state because uh, it's state includes not only set but it also includes the means and stuff like that, right? Uh, okay, so we do generate new set, new state, and every time you press R, every time you press R, you also generate new state like this. So we factored out that operation. And uh, here we can do recluster, recluster state. And what it does, it simply updates the clusters. Uh, recluster state. So at the beginning we generate new state, then we recluster state, and then um, we recluster it every time we press R. So that should fix the problem. Not really, because it says that we don't use recluster state. Uh, type voice defaults to int. What? What? Boys. Ah, okay. <laughs> Essentially, I made a typo, and it basically interpreted as a variable without any type, and that basically means it has a default type integer because C is an old language. There we go. Okay. So now every time I refresh this entire thing, as you can see, uh, yeah, we have different state and different reclustering and stuff like that. All right. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So now we need to implement the second step in the k-means clustering, right? So we implemented only sort of like assigning step uh, is only first step, right? So we just recluster everything. And now we need to do update. So for each cluster, we need to find the sum of its points and divide it by the, um, the length, divided by the length, and that should be... But how does it work in the sense of points if x is multi-dimensional so the end result here is going to be a vector wait a second do we take oh yeah uh, mean is also a vector i'm an idiot okay <laughs> sorry. sorry okay uh yeah mean is also a vector <clears throat> so that's, that's fine that's fine it's fine do we add we actually make it equal right so what I want to do, I want to actually assign um, a special key to that. So let's actually say that maybe it's going to be space. All right, so this is going to be space. Here we're going to do update means, update means, and then we're going to do recluster. Right, so we update the means and we do recluster. Uh, so in update means, update means we are going to do exactly that. Right, so we're going to do exactly that. Uh, so for each cluster, so we're iterating the case, right? we're iterating the case, and uh, so we need to find the sum, right? So this is going to be vector two s. So this is the sum, and we probably can use vector to add vector to sum. So it's more like add. Yeah. So this is what we can do. So we're adding up uh, everything within the cluster. Uh, cluster i. Yeah, and that means we need to have a nested thing here as well. j, j less than cluster i count uh, plus plus. Okay. <laughs> caught myself. Caught myself. Uh, <laughs> 
Almost. Almost. Uh, Alright, so, and in here, after that, we take uh, x and we basically divide cluster i uh, count. Right, and we do that like this, because I think that's what it means, right? So this is the size of the cluster, right? This is the size of the cluster, so it's a power of that specific set. Um, right, and because of that, I think count may not be zero, right? So one of the things we probably want to do in here, we want to check that this thing is greater than greater than zero. Right? So that's kind of important. We're going to assert that as well. And once we've done that, we want to reassign min uh, i to s, right? We want to reassign min i to s. Maybe we can actually inline s everywhere, right? So essentially here we can start with vector to zero, right? And then instead of s in here, we are, well, I mean, that's kind of difficult. So we have to do it like this. So it's actually means because there's several of them. Uh, means i, and here we're also going to have means i. Uh, means i, there we go, and that means we don't need that stuff. So we're directly recomputing these things. Uh, directly recomputing these things. Okay, interestingly, wait, wait, we can have situation when the cluster is actually empty. The cluster is actually empty. So we we'll, we even had that at some point, I remember that. So we need to be able to handle that. So one of the obvious way we can handle that is basically like do that, update the mean only in case of that. But that means that the mean is never going to be updated. That's what it means. Right. Maybe we should do something in case of an empty cluster. Right. What can we do? We can regenerate the mean. Actually, that's a very good strategy, right? So if you ended up with an empty cluster, you might as well just regenerate them in, like put it, put that in a, in a different place or something like that. So um, how can we do that? When we are generating new state, this is what we can do. I think, what do you guys think? Is that a common practice? Because yeah, this is a very weird situation. And uh, like, what can you even do in that situation if you ended up with a cluster that is very, like, which is empty? Um, two, 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 two. Okay. Okay, so this is clusters. And uh, yeah, so I forgot to update all of these things. Let's quickly do that. It's not that big of a deal. It doesn't compile, but it's not that big of a deal. For example, here, right? For example, here, uh, we ended up uh, with the empty cluster and it actually regenerated uh, red, right? And we can keep updating it. And as you can see, they actually, okay. That actually converges very quickly, surprisingly. That converges very quickly. It's kind of cool. And yeah, we'll split it again. And eventually it converges. This is so cool. <laughs> oh. So yeah, this is k means clustering. Apparently, it's it's actually a very simple algorithm. I didn't expect that. Um, what if you have like less clusters, right? Like, let's say we have two, right? So what if I want to split it into how it is going to split it? It's not, it's not a bad way to split it, actually. Look at that. It's, it's not a bad way to split it. Uh, we can try it again. Another interesting way to split it. So we have a head and the ears. Uh, we can find it. That, that's a really weird way to split. But you can do that, sure. You can do that. So, and now if you have, for instance, uh, four clusters, like how would you split four clusters? Uh, so now we have four. So that's another way to do that. So it's just like, depending on how, on like different uh, initial states and the amount of clusters, you can actually split them differently. Okay, so um, what about like 10 clusters? Like, that's a lot of clusters, but we'll see, we'll see here. Okay, so here we have 10 clusters. <laughs> it's just like it found something, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, we can maybe increase the amount of 
actual clusters that we got, right? So here, <clears throat> for instance, I generate three blobs, right? Three blobs. Uh, what if I generate two additional blob blobs, but somewhere at the bottom, right? Somewhere at the bottom, something like this. So the actual blobs are going to be like this, right? So you have four blobs now, though we said that we have three Ks. Um, yeah, and it actually split it like that. Uh, but what if I say that we have five keys, right? So this is going to be five keys. Uh, and does it? Yeah. Okay. So it actually split them you know, more or less correctly. <clears throat> so uh, does anybody know interesting? like simple data sets that we could have used to, you know, K cluster. Like what could we use? Uh, we need to animate that. We could try to animate that, but I mean, I don't know. The leaf data set, I think. Okay, let me see. <clears throat> the leaf data set. Um, all right. This is a consist of collection of shapes and textures feature extracted from digital images. Okay. So is that multidimensional though? <clears throat> uh, so for the details on this data set on its attribute, please read me. Okay, so let's download. Okay, it just allows us to download this thing. Uh, how For how long is it going to be downloading? Uh, it's pretty big. Um, how big is it? <clears throat> How big is it? Uh, dataset consists of a collection of shapes and texture features extracted from the digital images. Okay. So let's see uh, what we can extract from there. Leaves. Um, and let me, by the way, put them in the description. Um, all right. So this is the leaves. Okay, uh, memes. Uh, let's go ahead. I hope it's not going to be a Z bomb, right? So because I don't trust those people, right? So they probably use Windows, and Windows people like to do Z. Yeah, it is Z bomb. I actually predicted that. Of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, read me PDF. Okay. Um, data description. Um, I don't know. Uh, the present data uh, database compresses forty different plant species. Table 1 uh, details each plant's specific name and the number of leaf specimens available by species. Uh, species number from 1 to 15 and from 20 to 36 exhibit simple leaves and species number from 16 to 22 and from 37 to 42 have complex leaves. Okay. Each leaf specimen uh, has photographed over a colored background using Apple iPad 2 device. Uh, RGB, RGB images have a resolution, blah, 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 binary version. Uh, okay, so it would be nice to have like a two-dimensional points though, right? So attributes, so okay, each leaf has attribute. Um, uh, aspect ratio, specimen number, a sensitive aspect ratio. We can maybe cluster them by aspect ratio. <laughs> it's one of the things we can do. Uh, uniformity entropy or by entropy maximum indentation depth or something as a metric factor uh, all right so consider any uh, for where x and y such as that I don't know what is I uh -huh, uh -huh. All right. so it's, suppose aspect ratio just defines the shape of the leaf right it's some sort of a shape of the leaf um, Convexity. That's a pretty cool data set, actually. Uh, so references evaluation of features of leaf discrimination. Development of a system for automatic plant species recognition. Holy shit, this is actually a cool data set for like, for example, machine learning and like, you know, classification and stuff like that. That would have been actually kind of cool. Uh, right. So are you using the Thuar? I don't know what it is. You mean the PDF reader? Uh, the PDF reader that I use is MuPDF. So, uh, MuPDF. That's the one. Lightweight PDF viewer uh, written in portable C. 
So it also has beam key bindings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it looks similar and uses beam key bindings. All right, so looks all interesting, right? Maybe so, and we can, okay, we can try to parse this mother flippers. So is that the like everything? It's not a particularly. Oh, that's actually look. I really like the, the color. Look at that background color. Holy oh, shit! Oh my god, that's that's a very nice pink. I love it. Uh, is Bukata. Oh my god, this is a nice background. Okay, so black and white, I suppose, right? So the, ah, okay, so this is sort of like a contour of the of the leaves. Man, like every time I'm looking through this data sets, I feel like like an actual scientist. It's just like I feel good about myself. So it's just like, look at that. Like we got it information. We conducted experiments. We're analyzing experiments. Look at that. So we have the data. We have the data. We have the technology. So where do we have the aspect ratio? So attributes. So I suppose aspect ratio is the fourth. Uh, data attributes three, uh, one. Um, yeah. One, uh, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, and I suppose they are numbered from one. So that's basically aspect ratio. That's basically aspect ratio. Um, and um, yeah, we can. OK, so if we want to cluster by like in two dimensional space, we can just pick two of the attributes. Right, so just like, yeah, so here's the a pair of attributes. Uh, can we just cluster them? Or, that's actually a very interesting one. So we have a class, right, so we have a certain class, and class could be one, um, you know, axis. And then ratio, and see how they cluster, like, with relative to their species or something like that. Um, another data scientist, I'm not sure if I can even interpret that in a very any meaningful way, but we can just try to do that, right? We can just try to do that. Why not? So the first thing we need to do, we need to basically parse this entire file, right? So that would have been interesting, right? So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so main.c, so here it is. Uh, leaf, 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 leaf. Okay, so here is the leaf, and when I do um, main.c, the first thing we probably want to do, we want to read the entire file. Um, so in knob, we do have a function read entire file. Yeah, there we go. So read entire file. Uh, the path is going to be a leaf path. And it's going to be char leaf path leaf csv. There we go. And we need to save that into like a content, into, into its own separate content. But I'm going to call it c uh, sb. Uh, and we're just doing it like that. If we couldn't read that, we just return one. So that means we couldn't read this entire stuff. Uh, right, and uh, so the next thing we want to do, we want to start iterating this entire thing by lines, right? So let's do st uh, knob string view content, right? And is there any way to construct the content knob SV from parts, right? So that's the thing that we probably want to use, right? It's from the parts, and how we're going to be constructing this entire thing? We're going to take the uh, string builder items and the string builder count right and that gives us the content so we want to start splitting by uh, by lines essentially right so uh, we're going to be parsing csv in a very dumb way by splitting by lines and then splitting by commas if you are anxious because of the escaping and stuff like that we don't have commas in any of the fields and we don't have uh, quotes anywhere it's a very straightforward like this specific file doesn't really use any weirdness of csv format so we can parse it in a very dumb way so we don't really need a special library to parse this specific file 
And if so, why bother like trying to find some sort of third party dependency and, and whatnot, right? So if we can just parse it directly. Uh, right. Advent of code 2023 parsing vibes. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to be parsing while we have some content in here, right? And I suppose now we need to do chop uh, by delimiter, right? So we're going to be chopping this stuff by the delimiter, right? So this is going to be content and the delimiter is going to be basically the new line, right? So that should give us the line. Uh, knob string view uh, view line like so. And then we can do uh, knob uh, log knob in four. Here we can do essentially something like this svfmt uh, svarg. So this is the line. Afterwards, I feel like I want to actually exit, right? So I don't want the con continue execution. I just want to see how I'm parsing this entire thing. Uh, okay, so we managed to split everything by lines, right? So we read the entire file and we split everything by lines, which is pretty cool. The next thing we need to start doing, right? We need to start splitting the uh, the line, right? So here, I, I think we're going to be splitting up until like we have something, right? Uh, uh, right. And essentially, we're going to do it like that. So this is the attribute and we're chopping from the line by the comma, right? From the line by the comma and that gives us the attribute. So and essentially, maybe we could actually print this entire stuff by doing something like this. So we can provide the number of the attributes, all right? The number of the attribute and this is going to be I and then the value of the attribute, right? So this is the value of the attribute. And then, um, right, we can basically split each an individual line by some sort of a bar, right? So something like 10, like this, so we can see each individual line. So here we go. So here are the attributes, right? And as you can see, we have 16 attributes, right? 16 attributes. And here are the numbers, right? So which one we should pick? Which one sh we should pick? Uh, we can pick um, class. I think it's a pretty interesting idea. And maybe smoothness or something like that, or maybe aspect ratio. Um, entropy, so uh, stochastic convexity, elongation. <laughs> Elon Musk uh, elongation. I think, yeah, I, I think I like elongation actually. Elongation. Uh, all right. So maybe um, we can have something like this: enumeration type def leaf uh, leaf attr. Right. So leaf attr. And maybe we can just enumerate all of them, though there is no really an easy way for me to copy paste those things, unless I open this entire stuff in um, Chromium, I think I could open it in Chromium. Uh, there we go. And then I should be able to maybe just select this entire stuff and Copy paste it in here. That was easier than I expected, honestly. That was easier than I expected. Um, so, class, specimen, specimen, specimen. Um, so, stochastic convexity. So, I'm just thinking how I'm going to be uh, approaching all of that stuff. So, obviously, I might as well just leave the numbers as they are. Right, because initially this one is going to be zero uh, and the rest are going to increment. So we don't really need this kind of stuff. That's for sure. We don't really need this kind of stuff. Uh, we probably want to add comma at the end. But furthermore, I want to maybe capitalize all of them. This like so. I think that's the easiest way to do that. Uh -huh. I wonder, I wonder if I can select some of these things in here and just say, okay, if you encounter, for instance, like an actual space, could you replace that space with underscore? That was easier than I expected. Okay. 
and then uh, we can prefix this entire thing with leaf. Okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so here I can query replace. Uh, boom. There we go. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Dub, 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 dub. Can your Vim do that? Can your Vim do that? Uh, all right, so no, but my Vim can do your mod. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. All right, so I suppose now, since we have the attributes, right, so we have the attributes, we can just basically, uh, right, do the following thing. If I, maybe even switch upon all that stuff, right, switch um, I, and basically leaf class, right, so this is a leaf class, um, so this is one, and then leaf entropy. So, and that's how we pick them. So, in the case of a default, we just do nothing. We literally ignore this entire thing. Um, right. So, that's a good idea, I think. That's a good idea. In any case, though, in any case, I think what we have to do, we have to convert the attribute that we got, uh, the attribute that we got, to, um, to a float. Right. So, we need to convert it to a float. <clears throat> so, and uh, funny enough, right, so we can have class, uh, well, I mean, yeah, okay, so let's call it class, even though uh, I, this is C, so it's going to be fine, All right, so I still want to use ZZ because the Emacs extensions do be like that, uh, right, so this is the entropy, and um, essentially, we're going to have some sort of a value, right, so attribute value, that we kind of like convert from the attribute. I don't really know how, but that's going to be the case. And depending on the like attribute number, we're going to do class equal value, right? Like that, or entropy equal value. So that's how we're going to be doing all of that, right? So that's basically the idea. That's basically the idea. Maybe even align that stuff a little bit differently. Um, right, so and if we want to capture more different attributes, more different attributes, that's how we can do that. Though I think it would be even more better, I think it would be even better if we just had something like point in here. All right, so and instead of like specific names, we would say x, y. There we go. All right, and then we can assign different attributes to different x and y's that's pretty cool right this one is to do we wouldn't really know how to do that yet right but that's the idea basic it's the basic idea so we can kind of control what kind of fields we want to use from that file file specifically uh right so and after that uh what we essentially do and we just append that to the set right so uh, di append, so this is the set, and we're just appending this entire thing in here. So that's how we're going to be reading this entire stuff. But that is not enough, actually. That is not enough. This stuff assumes a pretty specific range. So maybe we should um, derive the range from the, the the set that we've got. Right, so because here we have hardcoded minus 20, 20, but maybe we can handcraft it. Uh, somehow, maybe we can, but uh, it will be better to actually, you know, um, you know, automatically derive all that. So, how can we parse floats, right? So we have the problem is that the problem is that we have sized uh, um, we have sized strings. That means we cannot just use like str to f or anything because they expect an ultimated one, uh, right? So str to f, I think, yeah. They expect null terminated things. Though, in knob, we have a pretty cool shit. We have knob tmp sprintf, which is basically sprintf, which allocates stuff in the, um, in a temporary buffer, right? In a temporary buffer. We can use that, right? Essentially, what we can do, do that, svfmt, svarg, ATTR and that basically converts this entire thing to the C string, null terminated C string, which we then can do str to f to. 
right? So, and I suppose str2f accepts a second parameter, right? So we can just put null in there because we know that it's going to successfully parse everything. So it doesn't really matter. So we can say value like so, right? So, and then we can reset the temporary buffer, right? No big deal. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, reset, reset, uh, tmp reset. So that will deallocate all of the allocations made by uh, temp as printf, right? So hopefully that will kind of work. So that's a pretty good way to do that. And so we've got a bunch of points, which we can print, for instance, right? So we can print all of these points, right? Size t, zero, uh, set count, uh, plus plus i, set count plus plus i, and then we can do nob log nob info, uh, f, f, uh, might as well maybe make them look like vectors, if you know what I mean, right? So px, uh, py, so we get the points. So we need to go through the compilation errors. Vector 2, electric boogaloo, of course. And this one, p, oh yeah, so because it's more of like vector 2, p, set items, i, boom, we get the points. Yeah. Do, are they what they are? So obviously class is parsed correctly. Class, class is parsed correctly. So because we have this first class, then another one, and so on and so forth. The second one is aspect ratio, right? So we, entropy, right? We decided for the entropy, and entropy, in our case, entropy, is which one? It's the last one. So we can double check if it is correct. So the last one is 11756, 11756. Okay, so we parsed everything correctly and we can even control uh, which field we assign to X and Y by specific attributes. Uh, right, by specific attributes. So uh, that's actually a pretty cool system. And all of that in pure C without like third party dependencies, right? So we don't use CSV or anything like that. We can quite easily just parse CSV file and just assign different columns to different X and Y. And then we can reuse that to for K means clustering. Um, right. <clears throat> so that's, that's actually really cool. It is kind of surprising how much you can see, uh, achieve with simple code, not with C, Right, but with simple code. This is not about C, this is about simplicity. I already made that mistake before. People started to say, oh, C is such a nice language. This is not about C, this is about simplicity, okay? This is about le simplicity. Le simplicity. So, um, we need to figure out, we need to figure out what's the mean uh, x and max x, uh, mean y and max y, so we can map everything correctly, right? So we can map everything correctly. How can we do all of that? So we could actually do that as we gather the points, right? So we could have things like float min x, which is FLT max, then max x, which is FLT min. It's a classical way of doing that, right? So float, and then we can copy paste this entire thing and change it to sort of like y, right? And essentially if, uh, px is smaller than min x, right? So that means this is the new uh, min x, right? If this thing is greater than max, that's the new max, and we can repeat this entire stuff for y's as well, right? So we keep in track of the ranges. And we only need to pass these ranges to uh, projection, right? So we project uh, sample to screen. We project sample to screen. And I suppose we can simply get rid of this entire stuff and just accept all of these things like that. Min max, max x, uh, min y, uh, max y, right? And then as we encounter these things, we can just like bring them to uh, lower case. So they are lower case now. And now every time we call to this function, sample to screen, we have to provide this entire stuff like so, then uh, we probably need to get rid of the float, right? So it is not needed. So project, uh -huh. another project. There's not that many calls in here, so we can easily do all of that. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna try to compile this entire thing 
and what do we have right so when we generate a new state okay this one is interesting right so generating a new state actually kind of implies that we did have this thing okay i can accept uh float min x right since we're reading the state from the um from the file we don't really need this function anymore we don't really need this function anymore so i would maybe it would make sense to remove it but i want to keep it i want to have the mode of uh generating random shit and also generating like uh you know stuff from the file right so i want to keep like all of them i think it makes sense um right, so let's actually go ahead um can i just do it like that but i'll have to do Wait a second, uh, can I select this entire thing and then... Nah, I literally have to do that. But maybe there is a function in Emacs about lowercase, lowercase. Mm -hmm. So it would be kind of nice if we had a function that brings to lowercase everything within the selected region. Uh, right, so if we take a look at the bindings, ML so down case word so there should be something like maybe down case region uh right so let me see uh, down case you have evoked the disabled command <laughs> disabled command sounds funny okay it's disabled because new users often find it confusing okay so let's type yes enable for future no why would users find this feature confusing is this really that dangerous? I don't know. Here's an interesting thing. Here's an interesting thing. I've been using Emacs for more than 10 years, and I've encountered occasionally this warning about disabled commands, but I never actually legitimately needed that command. I was only st uh, stumbling upon these commands because I accidentally press pressed something. I don't, know, I don't know what. This is for the first time ever in my entire time of using Emacs, where I legit needed to use this one of these confusing commands. You just witnessed like a, you know, historical point in my life. It's just like, this is for the first time I needed one of those commands. I never needed them before. Like, I, I knew they exist because Emacs kept t telling me about this, like, confusing command, but th that's the first time I ever needed this shit. That is amazing. Did I level up as an Emacs user now? Uh, where were you when Zosin don't case his region? <laughs> yeah. uh, you must be confused about it. Emacs was right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's what makes it confusing. Okay. All right. Now I know. Now I know. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. But I now I want to use it the second time. This is the second time I need to use a confuse a command. Uh, so, oh, I can just do XL. Okay, wait a second. I can just do XL. Holy shit, this is so convenient. Can I... So that means logically that has to be XU or something if I want to bring to uppercase. Uh, yeah. And it was also a dangerous command. Uh, whatever. Anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and continue recompiling this entire stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And update the means. Ooh, I see what's going on here. Update the means. Because we still need min max thingy in case you end up with an empty cluster. So you need to sort of reshuffle the means and stuff like that. That makes a lot of sense. So maybe I should group this entire thing into a structure. But maybe not. I mean, copy pasting this stuff around is not that big of a deal. Honestly, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is because a query replaced x with y so max turned into may that's that's funny <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> that's fucking funny. Uh, all right. So this is max and stuff like that. Uh, all right. And every time we do that, we have to be passing min x and some other shit. All right. Uh, right. Right. Uh, All right, uh, request to state and um, yeah, requesting, I don't know why I thought that requesting the state needs this stuff, I'm an idiot, okay. Uh, it doesn't need this stuff. Okay, so it seems to be compiling, that is nice. That is absolutely nice, that is absolutely nice. So we generate a new state, and since we are um, essentially doing that, we're regenerating a new state, we probably don't want to do that, honestly. We probably don't want to do that. So I wanna, I'm going to disable this entire thing for now, right? Because it literally generates like a new data set, but we're reading the data set from the file. Uh, generate cluster. Um, defined but never used. Yeah, that is true. That is totally true. Okay, uh, I'm a little bit scared because that should be basically it. Right, that should be basically it. We um, parse everything, um, we assign everything, and then uh, we generate a new state based on all of that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, cool. We could also add a little bit of a padding uh, for min x uh, and max x, right? Something like uh, something like this. So let me let me let me show. Essentially, min x minus maybe axis padding, right? So max x plus, and of course, we replace x with y, and don't forget about may, right? So I <laughs> freaking. Um, yeah, it's hard, it's freaking hard. Hey, uh, let's say it's gonna be around like maybe four or something. Maybe it depends because it depends on the scale, though. It really depends on the scale. So, one of the things, okay, one of the things we can do, we can actually multiply all of them by two. I think that's the easiest way to sort of put it, uh, or maybe even you know what, multiply them by. Like, but by 10%, just add the margin of 10% to them. So just like a little bit of a space around them. I think that's a good way to do that. So though, interestingly, that will only work if mean um, is negative, right? And it's not necessarily negative, actually. Let's not do that, right? So it's kind of a dumb thing. Uh, so I'll need to think how we can sort of extend or so we, we have to work on the level of like vectors, right? So here's from the center. So and the vector, we just extend it like that. I don't want to go into that. It's too much. All right. So everything seems to be compiling and let's try to run K means. And do we have, oh, this is interesting. Okay. So X is a class, X is a class and Y is an entropy and they form these sort of strings, which is kind of expected, right? Which is kind of expected. We can start clustering them. Oh, right. So, and that formed very specific cluster. That's actually very interesting. That's actually very interesting. So this is entropy and uh, yeah, I want to take a look at the um, maybe entropy and aspect ratio, right? So let's actually say that the aspect ratio is going to be X and the entropy is going to be Y. How are they going to look like? That's very cool. Okay. So X is aspect ratio and Y is an entropy. Huh. That is... So there is like clear clusters i literally have no idea what that means any of this attribute means but i really like the fact when you 
try to dissect the data at different like um you know planes there is clear clusters within them um most leaves are round i guess maybe but i don't know the interpretation of these attributes uh, does that mean that the most of them are round uh so if this is the aspect ratio uh it's so the smaller the aspect ratio is the smaller aspect ratio is uh the rounder it is so that, that means i mean i would expect them to be closer to maybe ah here is the thing here is the thing we don't really know the value of this thing right so I, I picked a very dumb way of representing the axis is that a zero or is that one yeah no axis labels exactly exactly so <laughs> that kind of makes it difficult but yeah so we can probably we can print those things right so we can actually print them so knob uh, log knob info right and it's going to be something like this so this is x min x max x uh, and this is going to be y like so all right and we should have something like that okay x is one right so yeah aspect ratio of one means that they're more like squarish or roundish or something like that and uh, that tells us that the majority of the leaves are like roundish squarish right so that is true we, we can clearly see that so but there is a very specific cluster in here right of different things with a high entry with a high entropy generally right hmm that is very interesting so uh, what is the entropy though? Mm -hmm. So there is some sort of a definitions elongation and somewhere solidity, stochastic convexity, lobness, uh, entropy, a measure of intensity of randomness. Ha. Huh. Mm -hmm. We can take a look at smoothness. All right, we can take a look at smoothness. Uh, so we're gonna keep the aspect ratio, but we're gonna use smoothness for, for Y. Let's take a look at their smoothness. All right. So yeah, majority of them are just like that. Uh, and there is this cluster of uh, maybe longer, longer leaves, right? So the, the bigger the aspect ratio, the sort of elongated they are, but I mean, we have the think that measures elongation though right uh, so which means that we can take a look at that right so aspect ratio and elongation elongation <sighs> what the fuck the bigger aspect ratio the more elongated they are yeah it, it makes sense like it's not about really clustering it's not really about the clustering but it's so cool that you can fucking see that but i mean it probably depends on the definition of both aspect ratio and elongation right so it's just like the definition of both both of these parameters are related to each other that's why they form like a clear function so it's it's more about the definition right it's more about the definition but that's, that's kind of cool right so and yeah we can already extract different knowledge uh about uh about leaves uh is a metric factor stochastic convexity solidity compute uh elongation could be the maximum escape um so elongation and class for instance what about that yeah so I think using class as an axis is useless because class is more of a discrete thing. It's not a continuous sort of like a value. It's not a continuous value. So these clusters don't make much sense if you have class uh, as the x-axis. So though maybe within the single class, 
clusters do make sense, right? Within a single class, clusters do make sense. Uh, right. Oh yeah. So we did a little bit of a data mining, I suppose, today. Wasn't it cool? Wasn't it cool? I think it was pretty cool. And the, the coolest thing is that all of that could be done in C without any Python or anything like that, right? So, yeah. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, all right. So uh, we learned how to do k-means clustering, which is going to be the first step in me trying that legendary paper about less is more parameter-free text classification with gzip, right? So uh, the reason why I started all of that, right, is because I want you to try this, right? So basically, uh, classification of the documents uh, by k-means clustering by gzip of the document, right? So, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to do that next time, right? So we're going to try to do that next time. Uh, I'm going to read the paper. I'm going to research a little bit more, maybe gather the data, right? So because we definitely need like a set of documents that we want to cluster and, and stuff like that. Uh, right. And this is going to be a separate stream. Now I understand how k-means clustering works. So I think I'm prepared for this paper. I think I am prepared for this paper. Uh, all right. That's it for today. Thanks everyone who's watching right now. I really appreciate that. Have a good one and I see you all on the next recreation programming session with Mr. Azuzin. I love you all. Mwah.